This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome back, Awareness Explorers. Good to have you. And I am your co-host, Jonathan Robinson, and with my co-host, Brian Tom O'Connor. And today we have a special guest interviewee, uh, is Joan Tollefson. And before we in, uh, before we do a bio about her, let me just check in with you, Brian, because you know Joan. And uh, before we do the official bio, what might you say about her? Well, I don't know Joan personally. This is the first time I've had the pleasure of meeting her. But um, Joan, your your book, Awaken the Heartland, was one of the very first books that I read decades ago when I first mm -hmm. became interested in uh, non-duality and these sorts of teachings. And then recently uh, I, I read a, a more recent book, Nothing to Grasp, which I thought was wonderful. Great. Well. Between us, we have Joan covered. Uh, Brian has every piece of information about Joan, and I have almost none. But I do have her bio, so I will I will be starting with the curiosity questions. Uh, a little bit about Joan. She's a writer, lifelong explorer of what is. Her background includes Buddhism, Advaita, non-traditional meditative inquiry, radical non-duality, martial arts, and a lot of other things. Uh, she's the author of Bare Bones Meditation. Awake in the Heartland, Painting the Sidewalk with Water, Nothing to Grasp, and Death, the End of Self-Improvement. She currently resides in Southern Oregon. Well, welcome to Awareness Explorers, Joan. Thank you. It's great to be here. So since um, a lot of our listeners might not know your uh, many different occupations and, and things, um, how long have you been in the general field of trying to find out what the hell's going on and who we are? Probably since I was a baby. Um, but, you know, I um, I read about religion as a child and was really drawn to Buddhism, actually. Mm -hmm. And then in college, I read Alan Watts and the Upanishads and took a course on Vedanta and Zen and, and learned how to sit Zazen, Zen meditation. That was in the 60s. And... Um, and then I got serious about Zen meditation in the 80s, I guess it was, at the San Francisco Zen Center. Mm -hmm. And then, um, let's see, I met my my um, my main teacher, Tony Packer, in the late 80s, 80s. And she was an ex-Zen teacher who had left the hierarchy and the dogma and the traditional aspects of Zen behind, but kept mm -hmm. the silent sittings and everything. And so I was on staff at the center she created for five years in uh, Springwater, New York. And then I was with, um, then I discovered Nisargadatta and Jean Klein and was with various satsang teachers and non-dualists and all that sort of thing. I started holding meetings. My first book came out, I think, in 1996, and I started holding meetings at that time. So I've been doing it for, is that almost 30 years? Yes, a long uh -huh. time. <laughs> I, I was struck, you know, as I looked at your website, just how much you've explored in life and, and how similar our paths were. You know, I've, I've done a lot of what you just said and, you know, martial arts and addiction recovery and political activism and visual arts and uh, all these different things. You really are an explorer. Have you always been that way or did that kind of happen as you started to get into these different disciplines? No, I think I've always just had a I've always been a kind of curious, had a curiosity and an interest in things. And, you know, so, yeah, it's kind of always been there. Uh -huh. That's uh, that's beautiful. Uh, Brian, why don't you you uh, join in? Sure. Well, I found that when I was preparing uh, some questions uh, for this episode, Joan, I, I realized that so many of my questions were about how to talk to people about this, because you've been writing about this and teaching about this for, for a long time. And so I guess I'm curious about ways you found to talk with people about it in the face of objections and what I would call understandable misunderstandings, especially since you've described it as completely inconceivable. <laughs> yeah, well, gee, I don't know. 
I mean, I just kind of, I, I, the first time I ever gave a talk, which was at Spirit Rock of all places, um, um, my teacher at the time, Tony Packer, her advice was don't think about it at all before you give the talk. And I said, really? <laughs> and she said, yes. I mean, if you start thinking about it, just stop. Don't think about it. Just show up and trust in presence. And so I did. And uh, I've been kind of doing that ever since. I mean, occasionally, if I'm talking on a specific topic, I might give it some forethought and right. write some things down. But um, generally, I just kind of wing it. And um, my books just really pour out of me. I, um, I, I end up with too much material, not too little. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I don't, I, I have no idea how, how to, I mean, I just do my best to sort of convey how I see it. Um, and, uh, but, you know, nothing we say is ever quite right, as you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, you write books. Yeah, and it's always it's always it's always a matter of trying to find something that's sort of close, even though, you know, you'll never exactly describe it. But I guess it's it's to point the attention in a different direction from out there to to inside to what is noticing our experience. Yeah, well, and I, and I don't even quite um, necessarily go that way. I mean, I might be pointing people, quote unquote, I, quote unquote, outside, although I don't really see a boundary between inside and outside. But, mm -hmm. but you know, I talk a lot about se experiencing things as sensation, you know, just visual sensations, auditory sensations, somatic sensations. And I don't, I don't really talk so much about like, trying to be awareness or something like that. Although I do point to noticing this awareness and this spaciousness of aware presence. But um, so, yeah, I, I'm not really pointing people in or out, but, but more, I would say out of the realm of thinking and conceptualizing, not that we're ever going to give that up, but mm -hmm. seeing that for what it is and, and instead shifting attention more to the sensory energetic presence mm -hmm. itself and exploring that because in my experience when we you know when we're thinking about everything i mean what thought does is it is it freezes everything and draws boundaries around it and makes this flowing wholeness into separate things apparently mm -hmm. and um so when we're talking and thinking, we're kind of in that realm of separate things. And um, when we tune into sensation and just feeling the body or just listening to sounds or whatever, um, we have a direct experience of everything being fluid and impermanent and um, evanescent and, and transitory and, and, uh, we're not thinking that we're experiencing that. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm very interested in you know people getting an actual experiential taste rather than an idea of all this. Yeah, that really resonates with me because uh, people tend to filter their experience through their their thoughts, their memories, their imagination, etc. And and when you are only focused on just your sounds or the sensations in your body, they can only be happening now. It's not right. some idea, some memory or some imagination. But there are people who say, well, I am not the body and sort yeah. of have this kind of denial of the body. Do you find, uh, do you find any, uh, how do you sort of navigate when you talk to people about that and you talk about experiencing the body? Yeah, well, I, I don't resonate with that pointer myself. You know, I mean, I understand where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I like to say we're not only the body uh, and yeah. we're not encapsulated inside the body <laughs> looking out. Um, and the body isn't the solid, substantial, independent, separate, autonomous thing that we think it is when we're thinking about it. The body is completely 
interconnected with, interdependent with the whole universe. Uh, you know, we wouldn't be here without air and water and sunlight and our parents and our grandparents and the food they ate and everything. And, you know, so it's, it's, um, and, and when we, you know, when we just tune in and try to find an actual place where the body begins and ends, we can't find anything like that. So, and right now, as we're talking, like, I don't have the feeling that we're in separate bubbles, really. I mean, we are in these little squares on Zoom, but I mean, you know, in terms of consciousness, I don't feel like we're each in this walled off little bubble of consciousness. I have the sense that we're sort of in the same space, if you know what I mean. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so the body and the, you know, when we just sense the body, it's, it's not a solid thing at all. It's vibrations and tinglings and all kinds of different sensations that are moving around and changing. And even, even biologically, I mean, we're not the same body that we were five minutes ago. <laughs> everything has changed you know so um yeah so that's kind of how i like to see it but i find that the you are not the body you are not the mind those kind of pointers i think have the pitfall of potentially leading to some kind of dissociation or detachment that i don't think is it's at least not what interests me i don't want to be detached from life i want to be be life and be you know i don't want to feel detached and separate and that doesn't seem like the goal to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Joan, I was with a teacher for 26 years, and it sounds like you've had a, a couple of different teachers for a while. I'm wondering what your thought is in terms of what a teacher can do for us, and does a person need a teacher nowadays? Mm. Well, I don't think there's any any single recipe for whatever this is. So I don't think you could say everyone needs a teacher. I mean, Ramana didn't have a teacher. <laughs> um, so I guess if we have a teacher, then we need a teacher. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, we seem to get what we need. So I seem to have needed a lot of teachers. I mean, I went to a lot of different people um, and uh, which was very helpful to me. Um, and my main teacher, Tony Packer, I particularly, I mean, she, she worked by a lot by asking questions and she never, um, she always said that, that, you know, not to take it. She did. She didn't call herself a teacher. She wouldn't use the word. Um, and always said not to take anything that she said as some sort of authoritative truth, um, but to look for ourselves and see, and that could always be questioned or taken further or whatever. So, um, and she would ask questions like, um, what is this self? Can you find it? <laughs> you know, what are we defending? Look and see, you know, it was questions a lot instead mm -hmm. of, you know, instead of statements like there is no self, <laughs> uh, that could, or she wouldn't say there is no choice. She'd say, look and see, can you find, can you find something making choices? You know, so she, she kind of really, by the way she presented it, she encouraged exploration and direct discovery rather than adopting a bunch of beliefs and ideas, which it's very easy to do mm -hmm. for all of us. Yeah, that seems to come into the category of those understandable misunderstandings mm -hmm. that, that I talked about, uh, especially when you talk about questions, because most people, even a question like, who am I? people tend to think that their job is to come up with an answer. And uh, in your, in the chapter in your book called inquiry, what is it you, you write, you list a whole bunch of questions and then you say, these questions are not for conceptual answers. Yeah. And it, it seems like it, like the questions are there to make you look as opposed to come up with something conceptual, but that's a little tricky for people. Uh, have you found yeah. that? Oh, yeah, because I mean, for all of us, we're so deeply, deeply conditioned to to sort of live in the in the world of thinking. Um, I mean, you know, a baby doesn't see tables and chairs, a baby just sees colors and shapes, and it has to learn where to draw those lines and everything and categorize things and then see tables and chairs. And so, you know, we by the time we're adults, we're we're very much in the mental world. 
And, you know, we're very into our whole educational system is about thinking about things and figuring things out by thinking, or at least almost all of it is. Um, and, and so when you ask a question like, what am I or who am I? The tendency is to start trying to think about it and, you know, come up with some answer. And then if you've read any, a few spiritual books, you sort of, maybe, you know, some answer even, you know, <laughs> so you start saying something like, oh, awareness or um <laughs> mm -hmm. i remember uh there was a book called what is the sound of one hand clapping and it gave the answers to like a hundred zen koans you know uh, uh not that that's going to do anybody any good but i'm wondering do you have some favorite questions that you found help people uh point them in the right direction other than the traditional one who are you yeah well i mean I often encourage people just to to go in with sensation and try to find a place where inside turns into outside. That's one. Um, and um, I encourage people to watch as choices and decisions are happening, um, which is what Tony Packer pointed me to. And just watch and see how a choice or a decision actually unfolds. Can you actually find a chooser or a decider mm -hmm. and or are they you know if you're making a decision can you find a you who's making the decision or is it just like thoughts pop up like you should do this no you should do this no you should do this no you should do this and then all of a sudden there's this kind of decisive moment and you know what to do but you can't make that decisive moment happen any sooner than it does much as you would sometimes like to mm -hmm. um you know, and uh, so just paying attention and watching as decisions and choices happen, mm -hmm. you begin to see that, well, there's really, there's really no one there doing that. There, these things are just all happening. And it appears that I'm making choices, but there's really no me in there doing that. And, and um, the same with, with sort of looking for the self, like, can you actually find it? What is this me? And, you know, you look for it and you can't find anything. Um, at the same time, there's undeniably some kind of something that we call a person here. You know, there are three unique individual persons here right now. And that's undeniable. At the same time, you know, the more closely you sort of pay attention to what these persons are, <laughs> whether it's the body or the mind or the personality or any aspect of it, it becomes, you know, less and less solid and, and more and more like you can't pin it down. You can't find it. What is it? Um, so sounds like, a, sounds like the uh, electron and uh, what's that theory? <laughs> you know, you, you can't pin it down. If you know one thing, you don't know another thing. It's, the uncertainty yeah, principle. Yeah, yeah the yeah. uncertainty principle. Yeah. Yeah. It also yeah. sounds like the, the, the classic wave in the ocean analogy. I mean, we people say, yes, there is a wave. I can point to it. But, <laughs> you know, it's it's in a it's in constant, constant motion. It's mm. changing all the time. B, it's not any sub. It's just the ocean waving. So maybe we're just, I don't know, the universe peopling. Peopling. Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, that's how I see it. We're the universe peopling. You know, we're just <laughs> waves on the ocean. I like that analogy a lot, you know, because um, because there's undeniably different waves, but you can't really pin them down. They're moving, they're changing. They're not really separate from the other waves. And they're not, of course, they're not separate from the ocean. They're a movement of the ocean, as you said. And um, so it's a great analogy for kind of what we, as a separate, seemingly, we're not really separate. That's, that's, that's what's the illusion is the separation, but as a, as a unique, unique, whatever person, a unique wave. Yeah, I think people sometimes will go too far and uh, they go into um, what we interviewed Jack O'Keefe and she had a phrase called non-denialism where she recommended not denying that there are people. But as you said, it's the illusion that we're somehow separate. That's the illusion, not that somehow we don't exist or nothing exists because I think when people go there, A, it's sort of conceptual and B, they're it sort of creates resistance. Like, wait a minute, that's not true. Instead of just experiencing 
without categorizing. Yeah, yeah. When I hear people say things like, you know, there's no there's no person here at all anymore and and you know, the self is completely gone and and there's nothing here, nothing's happening. It's sort of like, well, <laughs> I always say to those people, then can I have the bank account associated with your name? You know, it's a good one. Yeah. Can I have that non-existent uh -huh. money in your yeah. non-existent bank account? Yes. <laughs> that illusory money. Um, yeah. Um, but again, you know, you look at, you start, you know, like in many moments of any ordinary day, I like to point out to people that in many ordinary moments, there's no me here. There's no sense of being a person or a separate person. You're just, washing the dishes or driving the car or folding the laundry or whatever you're doing. And, you know, you don't have any sense of being someone or being a person until a thought pops up, you know, like I shouldn't have said that yesterday. And then all of a sudden that thought sort of creates the mirage of the me who said that and shouldn't have said it <laughs> and all of that, you know, but, and then, you know, then all of a sudden it's kind of like, kind of, there's this kind of, you know, contracting down and feeling like little me who has done the wrong thing or whatever, you know? And, um, but in, there's often times throughout anyone's ordinary day, I think when that's not there. And, and I don't know that anyone ever gets to some marvelously enlightened place where that never ever happens anymore. It certainly hasn't been my experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I'm wondering if that's really just sort of the wrong paradigm. I mean, people think, okay, there's this point and before we're not enlightened and after <laughs> we are, as opposed to there is just being this, which is always there, never not there. It's always available. And we might maybe focus down into doing something that we need to do, like planning when to leave for the airport. And then, and, but when we stop doing that, we can simply go back to just being this without conceiving so it's sort of it doesn't seem to be like we must get to a state that we don't have now in the future yeah yeah i think that's a you know kind of a, a mistake that it seems like we maybe all have to go through or at least most of us have to go through where we reference you know awakening or enlightenment or whatever it is we think we're trying to get with um, a particular experiential state mm -hmm. and then we have this sense or the story of me getting it and then losing it and getting it and losing it and then you know finally it seems like we notice that that's that you nothing no experience is ever going to be permanent and that the, that that the me that's being referenced there who's supposedly getting it and losing it is is this illusory mirage and that you know what's really being pointed to is just everything you know and and that includes all sorts of dimensions of reality. I mean, we can look at things in so many different ways. You know, like I give the example sometimes of like, I think it's in one of my books of like, you know, during a famine, the starving child really is hungry and really is feeling hunger pains and the mother's grief really is palpable grief. But you can look at it from a cosmic view and it, it doesn't really matter. It's just another, you know, subatomic event in the universe. You can look at it you know, you can look at that event from many different dimensions. And, um, you know, one minute we're sort of experiencing ourselves as a person. And that's a functional necessity a lot of the time. And then another moment we're just experiencing seamless, boundless, present experiencing. Another moment we're just experiencing empty, spacious, aware, whatever. And, you know, it's just, I don't think it's about being in any one of those in some sort of ongoing way, but just, um, I mean, we can notice that, that, you know, sort of there is like a common factor, I would say, in every different experience, which is presence awareness, you know. <laughs> um, but that's not something, you know, that we, that like a chair or something. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. so you don't necessarily say that that more of that would be better which kind of puts pressure on a person to like be different than they might be in a certain moment yeah because and there's never you know there's not like more presence awareness i mean it's sort of like it is you know everything everywhere i mean we 
when, of course, we can talk about being more present or being more aware, um, like in terms of mindfulness or something like that, and we can mm -hmm. distinguish between being sort of lost in thought and worry and all of that and being, you know, just really awake here now to the present moment, so to speak, not that we're ever, not that we ever can leave the present moment, <laughs> but, but I mean, um, but in another sense, it's like, even if we're lost in a train of thought, if there was, if awareness wasn't here, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, there, there, we wouldn't even know there was a train of thought. I mean, it wouldn't even show up, you know, and, and it is the shape that presence is taking at that moment. So, right. you know, and I when, think it's very, oh, go ahead. No, no, continue, please. Well, so to me, it's like really liberating just to see that, you know, everything is included. Everything belongs, you know, it's like, um, yeah. That and, was pretty much what I was going to say. When that train of thought comes, it's not like awareness goes away. I mean, there is that sort of spacious beingness in which that train of thought appears. And then if we have this idea, oh, that train of thought shouldn't be there, then we're putting our conditions on our experience, which awareness itself, even though it's not really a thing, but doesn't have those conditions. It's like... Uh -huh. It's like a mirror. Everything that appears before it gets reflected choicelessly. Yeah, it accepts everything, clings to nothing, and uh, I. It's like unconditional love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I have a question about meditation. Uh, you know, you've done a lot of different things, a lot of different practices, and. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist and people sometimes come to me for spiritual coaching and they ask, you know, should I meditate? And I, I try to come up with some way of saying, well, try different stuff and see what works for you. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different types of meditation. I'm wondering what you recommend around the idea of meditating and, med and different types of meditation. Yeah, well, I mean, that first of all, I think there is no one size fits all approach to any of this. So I always encourage people to find their own way and trust their yeah. own, their own intuition about what, you know, do what, actually, again, we're not really choosing it, but whatever shows up will show up. <laughs> and you'll either find that it seems to open doors for you, or it seems to just get you more and more confused. And then, you know, what something will follow, but, but, um, sort of for me, I mean, I, when I meditate and I, I do sit down on my cushion every morning. Um, and, um, but I don't, I don't even really think of it as meditation. I mean, I kind of don't even use the word. It's just like, I'm sitting on my cushion now mm. and it's no different than sometimes when I'm just sitting in my chair, not doing anything else. Um, Although there's something about sort of the upright posture that and having the body in a certain posture that I find is um, is in some way um, helpful. Um, and uh, and I probably got that from Zen, which puts a lot of emphasis on the posture that you're in and all that. In my opinion, a little overemphasis there. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I do find that that it's different sitting on a, you know, in my upright on the cushion and sitting, you know, in a recliner or 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 laying down. I mean, those are those are all kind of like different ways to be. And they're all they all have different strengths and weaknesses. And uh, you know, I'm personally inclined not to try to do anything when I'm meditating, just just being there and seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. And um so that's, you know, kind of, I would point people just to just sit, you know, just sit down and, or you don't even have to be sitting. <laughs> and there's really no difference between meditating in every other moment of your life, really. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, and you can, you can do this and, or do, but you can, and, it, you know, in many different situations, like, I think it's really interesting, like, if you're in a waiting room waiting to see a doctor or something, instead of getting on your phone or picking up a magazine, just sit there. And just, you know, look around the room, just feel your body, just sit there, just be. And, you know, it's, um, we, that seems to be really a radical idea in our present culture. <laughs> it but, is radical. Um, 
Mm. Yeah. And so, and, but I think, you know, taking time just to be in silence and not doing anything else um, is, I find is very enjoyable and very transformative and revealing. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. There seems to be a, a, a pattern about not doing, I mean, people think of meditation as something they're going to get good at and something that they're going to do and a skill they're going to acquire. Um, and something that's going to change how they feel. Uh, if I sit down to meditate with the idea that I'm not feeling good and I hope to feel better, or I had this wonderful experience yesterday and I'd like to recreate it, they both <laughs> fail. And, uh, and just not having any conditions on experience and just seeing, well, what is happening right now without trying to change it. And when people object to the word practice, because they say, well, how can you practice being what you are? I'm wondering whether maybe they're missing that. Sometimes it's not easy to not do anything. Yeah, it's actually incredibly challenging. So, you know, I think um, we're often, we're often told in the beginning, at least in Zen, you know, that this is not goal oriented. You're not going anywhere you're not trying to get something it's just about right now just this mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course what the mind does is say well this can't be it um and you know <laughs> and yeah mantra. yeah and i'm i guess this can't be it and i'm something better needs to happen something else needs to happen and so it's kind of inevitable that that's that's going to arise but yeah. So I think a lot of what happens in meditation is you just start seeing your thoughts because I think most of our thinking is going on so quickly and we don't even notice, we don't see what our thought patterns are and stuff. So a lot of what's happened for me in meditation is discovering, um, you know, certain thought patterns, just noticing, oh, I'm always thinking about the future. That's interesting. And then, and then, and then you start to see it more and more or, Oh, I am always having this thought that this isn't it. Oh, that's interesting. And you start to see it more and more. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it is just seeing how we are always trying to get somewhere else and and um whatever else is going on. But yeah, it's um it's really not about going anywhere. It's really about being right here, <laughs> which we actually can't not be, which is of course the great the great discovery. <laughs> that, um, you know, there's really no way out. <laughs> the cosmic joke. Yeah, and oh, on the word practice too. I read something, I think it was Norman Fisher, a Zen teacher, and Tony Packer never liked the word practice. And so I don't use it that much, but, but, um, but I like the way he was talking about it. He saw it not as sort of a rehearsal or, you know, for a big game or a big, or a mm. play or something. He saw it as, as, in the same way you might speak of practicing medicine or practicing law, that it's kind of a vocation. It's a way of life. Um, mm. And I like that way of looking at it. Um, yeah, I like that too. You know, I, I uh, did look at your uh, website for a while, Joan, and I was struck by the part where you focus on movies that you recommended. <laughs> Because it was unusual. And also, I noticed that we have the exact same taste in movies. It was like my my top 30 movies were all in your top 30 movies. And <laughs> and um, I'm wondering why you chose to put that there and, and what you think people can get from movies that might be valuable to them. I don't know why I chose to put it there. It just happened. <laughs> <laughs> really, truly. Yeah. But I mean, I didn't sit down and think, I think I'll put movies there. I just found myself doing it. But um but I love movies, and I think movies, um, they open us up. I mean, we start, we see things that we didn't, we see parts of life that we didn't know about, or we, we see situations that we hadn't seen or thought about. It reveals things about mm -hmm. the world, about ourselves. Um, and, of, of course, they're entertaining also. I mean, it's just a wonderful um, way to have fun, um, you know, and um and and very moving often uh, mm -hmm. but and you know i mean there's it's really good for us to laugh and to be moved i mean i think that's 
all really wonderful. So movies often give that. You know, I was in this uh, group for a while where we had our A-list movies, like the top 20 movies. And it was in, and we were kind of encouraged to watch them again and again. So uh, probably of these 20 movies, I've seen them an average of 10 times each. Uh -huh. And what was interesting to me was how they would affect me differently at different times and how I maybe on the 10th time I would see something that I hadn't seen the first nine times. And it showed me how much I might be normally missing in life because i'm not paying close enough attention and and also the lessons you know movies often have lessons to them and having that lesson over and over again was was a powerful way of of getting a lesson without having to maybe go through uh the experience the the hero in the movie had to go through for <laughs> 20 years or something like that so yeah yeah it's like uh I sometimes watch movies more than once if I really, I just recently watched Baby Teeth several times. Great movie, highly recommended. Ba baby um, Teeth? Baby Teeth, all one word, Baby uh, Teeth, like the uh, kind of teeth that fall out when you get okay. your adult mm -hmm. teeth, Baby Teeth. It's an Australian movie. It's funny, but also serious and poignant and beautifully acted. And um, yeah, I mean, well, it's an art form and a good movie anyway, is an art form. And, yeah. and um, so you could watch it many times and see all kinds of different, things that you didn't see on previous times and also if you it's like reading a book i mean you can read the same book and mm -hmm. it can be a completely different book if you read it at a different time in your life or or even if you just start over and read it again you'll see all sorts of things in it that oh i didn't see that the first time you know yeah. and and uh so yeah definitely well thank I you for doing that I love movies too, and there's such a there's such a rich metaphor. There's so much, I mean, there's there's the whole metaphor of the fact that it's individual pictures sort of going very fast, and we create the motion in our minds, and the whole metaphor of of how we identify with the character in the movie, and maybe that's what we're doing with our own imaginary selves in life. Maybe this is just a movie, and we're identifying with this sort of made up personality yeah and with so many other things too i mean it's kind of like we identify with certain people we identify with certain causes we identify with you know, certain situations you know right. and it's kind of like <clears throat> it seems just to be seen seems to be something we do as human beings sometimes and again that's just something that meditation also helps to reveal is sort of the things that we're identifying with and and maybe loosening the grip sometimes, mm -hmm. especially on our opinions and things like that. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's loosening the grip, speaking of loosening the grip, I, when I talk to people at various meetings and, and sessions and things and listen to the questions they ask, I find that practically all the questions are Basic, even if they sort of understand in some intellectual way that they are not the individual self or the individual self is illusion, all the questions are about, well, how do I get this? Yeah. <laughs> They're all practically all variations on the same question. And so I was wondering if that's been your experience and do you sort of have a good way of sort of navigating through that or helping them or... Oh, I think that's absolutely the case, you know, and it's like, it's a great thing just to point out and to start to be aware of that any of those thoughts or questions that we have about, you know, I'm not there yet. I haven't completely stabilized yet. I get it, but I haven't completely embodied it yet. Um, oh, I, I'm not quite sure about this yet. Yeah. Uh, how do I do this? All those questions that come up for all of us, you know, at different times, I think, um, they're all referring to that little mirage me. They're not referring to this whole happening or to awareness or to presence. Um, you know, aware presence isn't trying to figure out, um, well, let's see, I I get it, but I'm not completely stabilized in it yet or or uh -huh. <laughs> all those things, you know, and um, or let's see, is there is there choice or isn't there or, uh, you know, just Right. All of those things are just presence awareness is that, you know, it's sort of like, it's always the little me who 
is sort of trying and with, with this background story of like, because the little me always feels deficient. It always feels incomplete. It always feels not good enough it, in some way. It's because it is, it's a fragment. It's, it's a, it's, you know, so it's like, we're always trying to sort of find it wholeness or, or, you know, find what will fix it finally, or make mm -hmm. it okay. And on the human level, that just never happens, you know, no matter how, no matter how much therapy you do, no matter how much meditation you do, you're still going to have, you know, dark days and, and, you know, unpleasant moments and all that, maybe some people more than others, but you're never going to get to a place of just perpetual sunshine. Um, so, so yeah, but the little me is always sort of looking for that. Mm -hmm. And do you sort of just point that out or how, how do you approach it with people? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's a really helpful just to, just to sort of notice when you're asking a question or having a thought, who it refers to, you know, is it referring to this little me? And you start to notice that, oh yeah, it is. And yeah, and I've kind of already seen that that's an illusion. Uh, once again, that there's the little me in that, you know, mm -hmm. I've seen that, um, but somehow I keep having this problem, you know, right. Right. how can I get past that? And you just start to see, you know, I remember when I was really obsessed with sort of finding this final complete enlightenment, you know, because I would listen to these teachers and they would say, they would say that they were, you know, awakened or whatever, and they would describe it in some way that didn't feel applicable to me. Like they would say, well, they never had a, they have no sense of a self anymore. And I would think, well, I can't say that. Or they would say, you know, I never, no anger or anything like that ever arises anymore. And I could, well, I can't say that. So, so I kept thinking, well, there's obviously something more. There's some, you know, huge breakthrough that these people have had and I haven't had it. And, um, and I was just really, you know, I, obsessed with that and then eventually it just sort of started to I started to see more and more wait a minute this is all about me this is all about me getting to some future experience where me is going to be you know a whole lot better than me is now and you know comparing me to Ramana and, and I'm not saying you know that there aren't differences between people and you know that some people are more or less caught up in in what we might call delusion, but but um, but yeah, it was just a, it really ended that for me when I really saw. Wait a minute, this is all about, all about me, and it's all about this fantasy about some big event in the future. Um, mm, wonderful. You know, I I, I um, am a psychotherapist, and I sometimes uh, help people with the medicine of uh, MDMA, uh, often known as ecstasy, because they're working with trauma type stuff. And people come to me thinking that if they could just work through all their childhood trauma, they would be totally free. <laughs> but it seems to me like that never really, there's no end to that. Uh -huh. you know. So I tell them, you have to balance it out with like just being present with whatever is. And that almost seems like a new concept to a lot of people because you know trauma is getting getting a lot of attention nowadays. And I think people overemphasize that I will somehow work out every knot in me and then I will be enlightened. But that doesn't seem to be how it how things necessarily go. No, not at all. I mean that's not in my experience. And and um yeah, I mean I think I mean I've done been in therapy a number of times and you know I sobered up through a therapist being mm -hmm. in therapy and so therapy has saved my life I mean I have great I have great appreciation for psychotherapy mm -hmm. um, of different kinds but um but it does it's not like it fixes you once and for all and then you're okay right. I mean it just doesn't work that way and I and you know I think I've spent time trying to dredge up certain childhood memories, like if only I could really remember this, you know, and I could, then I'll be free in some way that I'm not, but it, I don't, it's finally, it just sort of like, I don't care. I'm not, even if I were to dredge it up, I don't know, you know, memory is very unreliable. How do I know what I dredge up is even what, what actually happened, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's a pitfall in both psychotherapy and well, actually, every time I've done therapy, similar to every spiritual teacher I've been with, sort of the ultimate realization is that, you know, there's no problem, really. Like, I, I you know, I went in to see this Zen teacher once, and, you know, it's 
it's like I it's like I was you know carrying my little bundle of problems around with me like mm -hmm. this precious thing and I I went in for a meeting and you know sort of opened my little bundle and here's my problems you know this is what we're trying to fix and he said hmm sounds like you think there's a problem yeah right 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 <laughs> and that's the problem and that's the problem yeah <laughs> more and more it's been occurring to me that the separate self is this concept of a problem to solve i mean yeah. that they're almost the same thing yeah if yeah. the same not not really a thing thing yeah yeah, yeah luck kelly has a thing if if what, what, you know it better than i do brian if there was no problem to solve yeah he would say well what well i i like to i sort of paraphrase it who would you be with no problem to solve although i yeah. think he words it slightly differently what what is here with no problem to solve right but i found that exercise to be really fruitful yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's well, it's kind of like in Byron Katie's, you know, four questions. Mm -hmm. what would I be if I didn't believe that thought? And then you just like, oh, I'd be fine. There's just you know, that just be being here, you know. And it's like, I think we're we do seem to be very attached to our problems. Like I was describing, have my little bundle of precious problems. You know, it's kind of like there's almost this fear of like, who would I be without my problems? Because really, we wouldn't be nothing. We would be nothing. You know, we'd just be sort of like this present happening, like empty space or whatever you know and it's like yeah. whereas the problems you know seem to define us and make us into somebody and um it's the same way that we're kind of attached to getting into arguments and things like that it's like there's some way that it it kind of reinforces this sense of me yeah and we compete like oh my problem's better than yours yeah yeah like yeah <laughs> like i'm more oppressed than you are yeah exactly <laughs> the, i call that the the victim olympics yeah yes that's, <laughs> yes that's big nowadays i've noticed it is yes. it's very big yes <laughs> <laughs> well anything else that we you feel that you want to cover that we haven't asked you about not that i can think of well then maybe this is a good time for a little bit of a guided meditation that you can uh uh spontaneously guide us in Okay, we'll see what happens. <laughs> hmm. Well, let's just start by like maybe taking taking the attention off the screen and just looking somewhere else in the room that we happen to be in. And just really seeing what's there, just enjoying it as colors and shapes and textures and light and shadow. Just noticing that you could really look at one little place for hours and keep seeing something new there. You start to just really notice the richness and the infinity that's there. Maybe close the eyes and just hear whatever sounds are here. It might just be the sound of this voice or maybe there's other sounds, traffic or birds or somebody moving in another room, whatever it is. And just hearing it as sound without judging it or interpreting it or labeling it, but just enjoying it as a sound. Even if it's a sound that we might normally think of as irritating, even if it's a leaf blower or something, just what is it like if we're actually just really listening to it, interested in it? And then maybe just feeling the body. Feeling the place where the body meets the chair. And see if there's any place in that sensation of body meeting chair where the body ends and the chair begins. Can you actually find a place where the body ends and the chair begins? Or is it one undivided sensation with no clear borders, really? And 
and maybe look to see if you can find an actual boundary between inside of you and outside of you. You can think of one or picture one, but if you just feel into it, can you actually find it? Is there actually a boundary? Is there actually a place where inside turns into outside? In experience, is there actually a place? Just noticing that everything is right here. We might know that the sound we're hearing comes from outside, but in experience, isn't it just right here? The sound of this voice, is it inside you or outside you? You might mentally know that it's coming through the computer or something, but in your actual experience, isn't it just right here, inseparable from you? Utterly immediate, without any separation, without any gap? And if you open your eyes again, isn't the whole room just right here? Even the, even the, even the knowing that whatever is over on the other side of the room, it's still all just showing up right here in this immediacy. And we never actually leave this here now, presence, immediacy. Everything happens here now. And the form it takes is gone like just second by second by second. But the here-ness, the now-ness doesn't go anywhere. It's just always here. We could say that that's awareness or consciousness, but we don't have to put a word on it. And although there are many shapes and colors and distinct forms showing up, it all shows up as one whole seamless picture, doesn't it? Like one whole seamless movie. It's like when you're watching a movie, there's lots of different events and seeming time passing and long shots and close-ups and lots of changes, but it's all happening as one whole movie, one whole seamless movie that actually doesn't move anywhere. It's always right there on the immovable screen, as they say. <laughs> and Or that we could call that here now. It's always just right here, right now. And yet it's always changing shape and color and texture and form. And it's all just right here, inseparable from what we think of as me. If I don't think about myself and go into thought and memory and imagination, what am I right now? Does this presence, this aliveness, does it have a gender, an age, a name, a nationality? Joan has all those things, but Joan is just something that's appearing here intermittently. And when you look for Joan, you can't really pin down what Joan is, where she begins and ends, or what she actually is, because she's always changing. And right now, Joan is showing up in you. We're all sharing this here nowness, this space. Maybe that's enough for now.
That was excellent, Joan. I I, I definitely got the Joanness over here. No, oh, yeah, that that was wonderful. I loved I loved how how all of the different parts of it, all the the, the sensations, the sounds, the sights, and the and the concept of the self all appear in the same sort of being beingness, awarenessness, what non placeness. Yeah. Yeah, and we can't even find a boundary between awareness and the content of awareness. You know, right. it's like right. it's like we have these words that sort of help us to notice different aspects of this, but at the same time, can't really find any boundaries between what this word is pointing to and what that word is pointing to. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a seamless whole. Yeah. As Neem Karoli Baba used to say, it's all one. It's all one. <laughs> it's all one. <laughs> it's all one. <laughs> it's all one. <laughs> I really appreciate your the clarity of which you point to things, Joan, it, uh, and simplicity. It really um, resonates with me, and, and I thank you for that. It's a, it's a rare talent to be able to take some of these concepts and just bring them to their simplest you know, uh, place in a way. So well, thank you for that. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Yeah. You know, sometimes from when you're inside, it's like, it all seems like chaos and, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How can people get in touch with you if they want to do that, Joan? Um, oh, I have a website, www.joancollison.com. And I have a sub stack where I publish articles it's they seem to be coming out about once a week although i don't follow any kind of schedule or timetable but um but if you can subscribe to my sub stack and then you'll get them by email or you can get the sub stack sub stack app and get them notified that way mm -hmm. um and um i have facebook pages although i'm less and less i don't use those as much as i used to so but i'm i have them uh -huh. And they do put things on there every now and then. And what else can they do? I guess that's, and I hold meetings. I, well, at this point, I'm basically meeting with people individually on Zoom. I haven't been doing group meetings for a few years now. So let's start up again on Zoom or something. But at the moment, it's just individual meetings and people can find out about that on my website. Which has a lot of great movie recommendations, <laughs> I might add. Yes, and you could just take up watching movies, and who knows? It might take you straight to enlightenment. <laughs> well, you know, um, there's a, a show, uh, um, Money Something with Jim Cramer. It used to be called Watch TV, Make Money. Um, now we need something, watch movies, get enlightened. That would yeah. be a good... <laughs> Yeah, the easy way, you know, the, the, easy, easy, way, yeah. the easy way to enlightenment. Um, yes. Um, well, it's been wonderful talking to both of you. I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed your um, Awareness Explorers program a number of times in the past with hmm. different guests and uh, it's wonderful to be here. Well, I'm delighted. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And it was really fun to talk to you. I, I find it so enjoyable and, uh, and, um, just the, the feeling of it, not just the ideas about it, where uh, I found joyful. Oh, I found it very joyful to be with both of you as well, truly. Good. As we like to say to our listeners when we sign off, uh, always keep exploring. It never <laughs> ends. I like to say that it never ends. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. We'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends, because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.